No, okay. It was, it was two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here about the Arun of Bohm effect and Hawking radiation. Well, I must say I speak about the analog of the Aharon of Bohm effect and the analog of Hawking radiation in dielectric materials using connections between dielectric materials and uh, space-time space geometry. These connections, they have become popular in relation to invisibility. So let's start with the literature on that subject. And there's Herbert Wells, The Invisible Man, and you can compare it with The Invisible Woman, who's a cartoon character from the Fantastic Four. The Invisible Man is transparent, and The Invisible Woman is not naturally transparent, but what she does is she has some sort of force field with which she curves space around her, such that light goes around her and makes herself invisible. And that is, in fact, the way how that is implemented in physics. But instead of the force field, it's enough to consider an, a medium. And the reason behind this is the following, that media correspond to geometries, as explained uh, in this view graph. So and the statement is that Maxwell's electromagnetism, Maxwell's equations in a general geometry or in generalized coordinates can be understood as the effect of a medium, where uh, Maxwell's equations are valid as they're written in the form you see, but the ma uh, material occurs in the constitutive equations as if it, subs it generalizes a medium that tells you how the electric field, for example, is related to the dielectric uh, displacement. So, therefore, if you have a geometry that occurs as a material medium, or vice versa, if you want to create a geometry, then uh, that recipe tells you which kind of epsilon and mu's you need to make it happen. And that has been applied for invisibility devices as follows. You use a coordinate transformation. So you use a material that creates the illusion of light propagating through a virtual space, and that virtual space is empty except of one point. Now, in reality, what happens is that this one point has been extended to cover a finite region, and in this region you can put things in, and these things, they're excluded from the electromagnetic field, and therefore they're made invisible. Now, that is a spatial transformation of space implemented by dielectric uh, materials, but why stop there? You could also introduce space-time transformations, and they turn out to correspond to moving materials, not materials that are at rest, because if you have a space-time transformation, then you see what happens is that the geometry characterized by the matrix tensor carries in also time components. And they appear in the constitutive equations like a moving medium, essentially like a velocity that connects then electric and magnetic fields via Lorentz transformations. And here's the expression of uh, the material you get. Now, and that is related in a dielectric analog to the birthday paper of this conference to the Aaron Bohm effect as follows. Namely, the transformation you do is this. So you rescale spatial coordinates to create a dielectric index material by dividing it by a refractive index n, and you connect, you mix time and angle as uh, shown in this expression. That is incidentally the same as for the gravitational vortex we heard from uh, Mazur's talk. Now, and that creates then, because that transformation just connects one of the spatial coordinates with time, it doesn't change space. Therefore, light would still propagate along straight lines in space. There would be no difference there. But time is changed. And therefore, waves that propagate through space and time experience a phase shift, the Arnold of Bohm phase shift in that analog. Now, then you can ask what kind of system do you need? What kind of um, velocity distribution, velocity profile generates this? And you substitute it simply in that formula and find uh, this. So uh, you need a vortex in the dielectric, the moving dielectric material to make that transformation happen. Now, this is a transformation 
from, again, a virtual space to physical space, but there's a problem with this transformation. It's multi-valued because it connects the angle uh, with uh, time. Time runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, and the angle is confined between, say, 0 and 2 pi. And so, say, your virtual space is single-valued, but the physical space becomes multi-valued, and vice versa. And this cannot possibly be true. So what does the wave do? Well, and that is also something that has been worked out in Arnulf and Bohm's paper, that the naive solution to the problem we are discussing is that we have a wave that develops a phase slip. This is showed uh, in this picture here on, uh, from your point of view, the left side. And then, but in reality, that phase slip cannot happen, and uh, the wave has to correct for this and generates scattering. And that's the Arnold Bohm scattering that is visualized then in the picture you see on the, on the right side, and that satisfies the correct boundary conditions in space. So you could say that Arnold Bohm scattering is created by the conflict because between the single-valuedness of physical space and uh, the enforced multivalue to a coordinate transformation that is multivalued. And there is a similar example which also exists in moving materials, and that is a horizon. Now, a horizon can be visualized in a very simple form using moving fluid. It's shown in this cartoon by um, a children's book author, and uh, the picture was invented in, in a modifi slight modification by William Mundur. It goes as follows. Imagine you have um, a river like this uh, with water, and it's populated by fish. And these fish, they have a maximal velocity, let's say C, and uh, they swim against the current. Now, at some point, the current becomes faster than the speed of the fish, and then the fish are doomed. So they cannot possibly swim upstream anymore, and they slowly drift backwards, and then they are finally crushed. Its singularity falls on the left-hand side. Now, that is a cartoon picture of uh, a black hole horizon, but it is, in fact, quite an accurate description of it, and you can simulate it with light in moving media in one dimensions as follows. So if you focus just on one dimensional propagation, then it is, belongs to the same class of problems, transformations between space-time coordinates as shown in these formulas. So the first formula tells you that the coordinates of physical space you express in terms of um, two variables, t plus and minus, corresponding to the times in forward or backward direction, and it simply tells you this formula that light propagates with a velocity, and that velocity is given by the relativistic addition theorem between the velocity of light in the material, C over N, and the velocity of the material, U. And then you transform this, in, you express T plus minus the two propagation times in terms of the physical coordinates, and that is a valid coordinate transformation. If you then, again, if you substitute this into the machinery, you find exactly this. You find the propagation of light in a one-dimensional moving fluid. That's an exact solution of it. Notice that if you have a horizon, so when the speed of the material reaches the speed of light in the material, then the velocity clearly in forward propagation has a zero, and so therefore this var variable here develops a logarithmic singularity. That corresponds to two branches, on one side of the horizon and on the other side of the horizon. I would like to visualize what happens there, and perhaps the best tool of doing this is to use Penrose diagrams to visualize this. You have seen that also in uh, the first session this morning, examples of, of Penrose diagrams. Here is one. What is it? It's very simple. So it's simply it's a way of visualizing space-time in a finite region. And what you do is, this is a space-time diagram, the yellow lines are the lines where light is propagating, what you do is you do perform a conformal transformation with respect to the Minkowski geometry, and that puts the whole thing into a compact region like this one shown on the left side. Every coordinate side you see in the, every coordinate line you see on the right side has a faithful image on the left side, and that map is designed to be uh, conformal with respect to the Minkowski geometry, and therefore the 
angles between light rays are 90 degrees and they're also propagating along, along straight lines as before. Now, let's come back to the problem of the horizon. So we have uh, a velocity profile of the water in that example, and let's assume it's like this. So the water should on one side be moving with uni uniform speed, and there's a change. So you go through a horizon. On the other side, it should also be uniform speed. So we ignore the waterfall for simplicity, the uh, singularity falls. Then we can visualize this again with a Penrose diagram as follows. And so watch at the, look at these red dots here in, a, uh, in the picture of the velocity profile. They then correspond to lines in a space-time diagram. They, in fact, correspond to these red lines here in the Penrose diagram. And this would be the fate of a light ray. Now, in physical space, if you extend this to, uh, to time, uh, say the light ray would originate from close to the horizon and would struggle to get away from it like this. And there is an appendix diagram that simply is a straight line. And its all struggle is uh, conveyed in the picture by the way how these points are uh, located in the, in the space-time diagram. So that's one picture how you could visualize the propagation of light. Now, if you have a horizon, then this Penrose diagram has two branches. So one is the branch on the right-hand side of the horizon, and the other one is the branch on the left-hand side of the horizon. And then you have two choices. So you could leave it open, as, as shown in the picture, or you could fold it. And that would be the same description, essentially. It turns out that these two have two different physical meanings. One of them, the, the folded one, corresponds to waves that are incoming. The reason for this is that uh, an incoming wave is a wave that has strictly positive momentum. It's propagating forward. And hence, it has to be described by an analytic wave function that you cannot cut into two pieces. And so, therefore, that must correspond to the folded geometry on the left side. Now, on the other hand, the things you see, they belong to either the right or the left side of the horizon. So therefore, they, these waves you visualize as belonging to the open form of the Penrose diagram uh, of the horizon, either on that or on the other side. Now, if the picture is different for incoming and outgoing waves, then inevitably there must be scattering. And there is another peculiarity with horizons that I haven't explained so far, is that if you look, if you imagine so that uh, a wave in virtual space like this has two images in physical space, one on one side like this and another shadow image on the other side of the fold, then that corresponds to negative frequencies. The reason for this is simply how do you count the direction of frequency, the direction of propagation there is in this diagram here. So that is, in a way, is a positive frequency going from here over there. If you imagine this thick yellow line is a wave packet of light that consists of wavelengths, then the frequency would give you uh, the, or the way how these wavelengths oscillate tells you what the frequency is. And it clearly is then the same in that direction. But if you fold it, it becomes negative of it. So therefore, the scattering you have is a scattering between positive and negative frequencies. Now, if you have that, then that corresponds in quantum mechanics to the creation of particles because the negative frequencies would correspond then to antiparticles. And that is behind Hawking radiation. So here's another important paper that uh, made a big impact in physics where Stephen Hawking predicted that black holes are not black, but they're radiating to due to quantum effects, and in fact, due to the scattering at the horizon. And that effect has been important because, like the Arnold-Bohm effect, it connects various areas of physics, in particular uh, gravity with uh, quantum mechanics and thermodynamics, because it turns out that uh, this Hawking radiation essentially acts or looks like a black body radiation that is characterized by a temperature. So that's has been very influential. On the other hand, the bad news are if you put in the number in this formula, you realize that the effective uh, Hawking temperature is very low. It's about eight orders of magnitude below the cosmic microwave background for ordinary black holes. And hence, 
uh, there's precious little chance that you could observe this in uh, reality. But with this analog I showed you, it's possible. And this is something we are working on in the lab, uh, that uh, we, we're using optics to simulate an event horizon. Now, you could ask, that's a very, very difficult task. Because if you look at this picture, what you have to achieve is you have to create a situation where something like the water in the picture moves as fast as the fish, and the fish you would replace by light waves. So you have to move something at the speed of light in a material. That sounds very difficult, but in fact, it's actually quite simple. And it happens all the time in fiber optics. So if you have a fiber, as the one shown here, and you send pulses through the fiber, like in optical telecommunications, where information is encoded in pulses, then what these pulses do, they change the refractive index of the fiber as if they would add an additional little piece of glass to it due to uh, the care effect. And uh, so they act as moving materials. And as these fictitious pieces of glass move with the pulses, they move at the speed of light in the material. So you naturally have systems where things can move close to the speed of light. And then you exploit the dispersion, possibly by fringes, of these fibers uh, to create horizons. So imagine a light ray that follows this pulse and uh, is slightly faster than it, but slowed down by it. Then there will be a horizon established at the back end of this pulse that slows down and stops finally uh, the, the pulse or the, the light wave that is trying to follow these pulses. In the Hawking effect, you would replace that beam by vacuum. So there's a vacuum mode chasing after these pulses, and they would produce photon pairs uh, belonging to the two different sides of the horizon. So therefore, you led to the remarkable conclusion that whenever you use fiber optics for telecommunications like long distance calls, or if you use the internet, you're making loads of black holes. You're making loads of artificial event horizon. And presumably, you also make a bit of Hawking radiation. <laughs> but it's incredibly small. So if you put in the numbers there, it's astronomically small. And what we do is we're working hard to make that effect actually observable in practice. And that really takes the latest in technology for it. Now, so what I try to explain is that some possible connections between different effects, in particular, the birthday effect of this conference, the Aaron of Bohm effect, and uh, Hawking radiation, both are manifestations of space-time transformations in transformation optics, where uh, you use the fact that a dielectric material acts like a geometry, and if that material is moving, it's a space-time geometry, and vice versa, if you want to create a geometry, then uh, you can use a, a material, and for space-time geometry, a moving material would be required. So this is something that connects or adds to the connections we talked about, uh, the connection between Maxwell's electromagnetism and Einstein's general uh, theory of relativity to the extent that they become uh, transformed <laughs> into each other. Thank you very much. <laughs>